Hello and welcome to Matt Brown and Dragas's joint webinar, Managing OT Cyber Risk, Lessons from the Front Lines. My name is Stephen Lilly and I'm a partner in Matt Brown's Washington DC office and a member of our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group. We're going to talk today about cybersecurity and operational technology contexts. So industrial systems and manufacturing, oil and gas, infrastructure, chemicals, and other sectors. We've been spending a lot of time working on OT cybersecurity matters in recent years. These matters have raised a range of important and complex legal issues that are only going to become more significant over time. The good news is that in many respects, OT cyber legal risk can be addressed with tools that are familiar from other cyber risk management contexts. So risk assessments, effective plans and policies, internal governance, training, and sound management of legal privilege. But our work has also made clear that OT cybersecurity raises distinct challenges. First, these systems are very different from systems that maintain the company email or other enterprise functions, and there are corresponding distinct technical challenges in securing them. Second, organizational structures and relationships that support enterprise security typically don't apply to OT security. So legal counsel and companies more broadly typically need to build separate internal structures and relationships to support OT security and associated legal risk management. Third, different legal regimes apply than in the enterprise context. As a result, legal counsels and companies more broadly need to make sure that they are responding to these legal risks in an appropriate way that is tailored to OT security. In today's session, we're going to highlight some practical steps that companies can take to achieve this goal based on our experience of what works and what doesn't work. We're very fortunate today to be joined by our friends at Dragos, who are leading experts in industrial cybersecurity and who will likewise share their lessons from working in this important field. As I mentioned, my name is Stephen Lilly, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice. I've been at the firm for a little over seven years. Before that, I was on the Hill, and that's where I started working on OT-related cybersecurity issues as part of comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. I'm joined by my partner, Veronica Glick, who is also um, in our cybersecurity and data privacy practice and our Washington DC office. Um, she recently, or she serves as a, on a pro bono basis as Deputy Chief Counsel for Cybersecurity and National Security to the US Cybersecurity Solarium Commission, and as a member of the United Nations Experts Committee regarding the prevention of terrorist exploitation of the internet. And then from Dragos, we have Ben Miller, who serves as Dragos' Vice President of, of Dragos Professional Services and R&D. Ben leads a team of analysts in performing active defense inside of ICS and SCADA networks. In this capacity, he is responsible for a range of services, including threat hunting, incident response, penetration testing and assessments for the industrial community, as well as advanced research and innovation. We're also joined by Kai Thompson, who serves as Dragos' Director of Dragos Global Incident Response Services. He's a certified SAMS instructor for the ICS curriculum, and he's spent seven years in the automotive industry and 14 years in the steel industry in various security roles, including incident response and business continuity. And I really can't overstate how fortunate we are to have uh, Ben and Kai with us today, really are experts in this field. And I know we'll be providing a lot of really helpful in insights uh, for our call today. Uh, maybe with that, before we get started, and I should say that Veronica is gonna moderate our discussion today. Um, ben, um, I don't know if you wanna take a minute just to introduce Dragos for the folks who aren't familiar with it. And if I, I think I'm right in saying that your catchphrase is, safeguarding civilization. So no pressure um, <laughs> with, your, with, your, with the task you've taken upon yourselves. But if you, if you want to give us an introduction, that'd be great. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Absolutely. Uh, uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, good to be here. Dragos is uh, fundamentally, uh, we're an ICS uh, cybersecurity company, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, something similar to, to IT. Uh, so we're, we're focusing exclusively on the industrial control system space, and we really focus on three key areas of how how we're trying to solve the, that that uh, problem. Uh, one, first and foremost, is our technology that we deploy out and, and gain visibility into what is happening within our customers' environments and help them in their their security journey. We also have an intelligence offering as well, uh, so we actively track uh, multiple activity groups or, or threat actors that are out there that are focused on industrial control systems or have demonstrated some sort of capability against industrial control systems. I believe we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and then my team uh, from the services side, uh, largely uh, doing incident response activities, uh, hunting for malicious activity, uh, but we also do a lot of assessments, uh, penetration tests, uh, tabletop exercises, services of that sort. Uh, so that's our, our 
kind of three pronged uh, solution of knowing what's out there from an adversary perspective, getting the best expertise out there, and then feeding both of those into our technology. Great. So thanks, Stephen and Ben. Um, and for today's agenda, uh, we'll be discussing some of the key cyber risks specific to operational technology, including some of the, the legal and technical consequences stemming from those risks. Then we'll discuss a few fictionalized real world scenarios from both the technical and legal perspective, including a solar winds example. And then finally, we'll end with some uh, lessons learned that we hope will be helpful as you manage the cyber risks that we're discussing today. Before we jump in, I just have a couple housekeeping announcements. We're going to provide a CLE code, um, and you should note that down in the form that was emailed to you. And then if you have any questions, you can use the chat feature. It should be on the right side of your screen. So jumping right in. We're going to begin with discussing um, OT cyber risks. So in this section, we're going to provide an overview of what we mean by OT discuss the trajectory of cyber attacks specific to OT and some of the challenges in securing OT systems. And then we'll talk about some of the consequences, both technical and legal, of these challenges um, in cyber instances impacting OT. So Ben, before we kind of dive into the issues, could you provide an overview of what, what we mean when we say operational technology? Um, and in particular, I think it's helpful if you could explain how it's distinct from enterprise or product related technologies. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Veronica. So, so the 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 uh, term operational technology is an umbrella term, very similar to industrial control systems. It's an umbrella term that has a lot underneath it. Uh, uh, from a technology standpoint, uh, uh, the the kind of simple definition would be if it's a computer or a digital device that's somehow interacting with the real world, uh, that would be an easy way to define that. So, so specifics would be uh, a component of an ICS or an OT system would be the smart meter that might be on your house. It may be the protective relay that's in the sub, uh, substation down the street from your house. Or maybe the the generator that is outside of out, out of your town that's supplying energy to your house, uh, but we also it, it spans more than just uh, uh, electric power systems. Uh, certainly, uh, manufacturing is, is uh, or is getting highly digitized and interconnected. Uh, we, we also have uh, building automation systems. So if you're a bank, you still have uh, OT systems in the form of the, the uh, power systems that manage your data center uh, and, and, and the ground, the underlying systems for that data center are all traditionally considered OT environment. Uh, so these are these are some of the key components that run the day to day of, of the business. Uh, and and importantly, there's a distinction, not just in the technology, but it's also the group that runs and maintains and owns this equipment. Typically does not fall out of the, the what would be classically the. IT business unit or the CIO's operation. They are largely part of facilities. They are part of the the the, the plant or or the the main uh, the warehouse. Uh, and so they don't typically have the same oversight and and understanding that a lot of the enterprise systems uh, that are very traditional in the IT space have. And maybe just to chime in on one of the sort of a contextual point as well, you know, we're talking here about OT generically and ICS systems generically. I'm sure that Ben and Kai have perspectives that if you were, you know, all the different types of examples, they were talking about very specific technological and security challenges that go for in different contexts. And I should say from a legal perspective, that's definitely true as well. So, you know, we're going to talk generically today about general legal risk management. Certainly, you know, we could we could talk your ear off about specific risks and legal requirements in the electric grid or specific legal issues that arise in uh, manufacturing or whatever it would be. Um, but just know that we're going to be talking generically today. Happy to obviously to take offline any any specific questions. Great, thank you. So that was a very helpful overview of you know setting the scene of operational technology. So in this point, uh, we're turning to the threats to those systems. Ben, I know you and your colleagues have looked closely into attacks targeting OT. Could you provide an overview of the types of attacks we're talking about and how that that's evolved over time? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll frame it in the the very beginning of days of, of like I'll go back 15 years ago. 
uh, a, a lot of the the focus on OT ICS mechanisms were, was uh, really started to pick up uh, within the federal government. I, uh, the Idaho National Lab did a test uh, called the Aurora Generator Test in 2007. That was the first time uh, that, at least that we know of, uh, where they they programmed a computer uh, specifically, which is a, a special type of computer called a protective relay uh, that's meant to protect a generator. And they used it actually to uh, physically destroy the generator. Uh, 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 black smoke, smoke moving from the machine, the, the crankshaft completely destroyed. So that that's at the stage for where we are today, uh, where uh, we have uh, known cases uh, of physical impact and potential and and a loss of life that that hasn't occurred yet. Uh, uh, but the, there has been uh, a multiple power. Uh, uh, power outages uh, in Ukraine 2015 was a large scale uh, power disruption event. Uh, and then another one in 2016 uh, uh, also led to the capital of Kiev being without power for an hour. It affected a transmission substation site. Uh, that was actually a piece of malware that caused that. Uh, and then in 2017, another piece of malware uh, called uh, focus on a safety system. So the safety system is really that mechanism within a refinery that makes sure that the plant is in a safe state. Uh, and if it's not in a safe state, it tries to return it to a safe state. This malware, uh, 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 Trisis, uh, sometimes called Triton, uh, it did exactly that. It, it impacted the safety system to put it into an unsafe state. Uh, uh, and so th this is the world that we are uh, in today. And that's compounded by not just the adversaries that are picking up uh, and moving towards the, these directions. We have opportunistic uh, ransomware uh, and we have more and more of these systems being uh, becoming uh, more interconnected uh, more interconnected driving uh, cost savings and efficiencies that they're, they're they're being connected for for a legitimate reason but they are exposing a certain level of risk to these systems yeah and maybe just one legal point is to to, to build on what Kai was saying I mean these threats have been around for some time at this point I think when you're in-house counsel and you have you know, a thousand different issues you have to deal with from antitrust and, you know, to employment law and what have you, and cyber is just one of those, you know, it can be challenging to, you know, to prioritize every issue that comes across your desk. And sometimes that feels like, you know, a, um, you know, the cutting edge issue, the, the issue that's going to be an issue, you know, a real risk for you in three years is something you just can't prioritize. I think this slide is really helpful because it just reminds everyone, you know, Stuxnet was, was a very real issue um you know a very real incident and attack um that's over 10 years old at this point so you know for companies who are in this space this is very much a present um issue and one that the legal consequences you certainly can't say well this is a new issue that no one was you know familiar with at this point um so i think it's sort of this is really helpful context from a legal perspective to keep in mind that you know companies have had you know notice of these threats at this point Right. I think so. This is helpful, especially thinking of, you know, with the frequency increasing and the increasing interconnectedness. Um, the next issue then is, you know, how do you address those threats and secure your, your systems? So from both a, a cybersecurity and an organizational perspective, um, we've seen that OT systems are unique and that securing them can be challenging. Ben and Kai, I'll turn to you first on this. Could you talk a bit about those challenges and how you approach them from a technical perspective? Uh, yeah, so the, the the nature of these systems in, in that they they may be uh, 15, 20 years old, and they, they, they have a, a much greater lifespan than a traditional IT environment uh, and, and how they operate. They operate very lean uh, 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 from just a business perspective. So that they don't have a, a understanding of what equipment they may have in a, in a industrial environment, whether it is on a plant floor or uh, within a substation or a ma uh, manufacturing plant, uh, they they don't know how many computers they have, where they're located, what their manufacturers are, what the, the software, the vulnerabilities might be. Uh, but they're also not actively monitoring those environments for intrusions either. Uh, and so a, a, I know we'll get into it in a little bit, but the the solar winds case study that we have. Uh, really highlights both of these challenges. Uh, not only do, do the uh, individual uh, companies and asset owners out there need to understand 
what software they have uh, in this case, if solar winds is there, but they also need to understand if there's threat activity that's being observed and they're largely can't, they can't answer those questions to date the, the, the uh, infrastructure that they have pushed out there. Uh, it simply can't answer that. Uh, and then the other challenge that I touched on earlier as well is the uh, uh, IT uh, and, and OT sort of divide. Uh, so the OT certainly has window systems, uh, but it also has embedded systems. It has uh, sensors, it has actuators, it has a lot of complexity there. E essentially, the OT is a bit larger in scope uh, than what the IT uh, 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 is traditionally used to, which offers challenges on uh, uh, communicating, uh, getting buy-in uh, from the different teams and, and being able to move in, in the same direction. Uh, and, and just uh, training of the workforce uh, is, is a, a real challenge uh, within the space. Right, and on this same uh, point, uh, sort of who you're working with and the ITOT divide, Stephen, when, when we work with clients in this space, we've um, noticed that there can be challenges from an organizational perspective. So could you explain that that challenge? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've seen um, for a number of clients that they've put a lot of work into building relationships with their chief privacy officer, building very strong relationships with the CIO, the CISO, who have responsibility for enterprise systems, you know, really thinking about how do we manage our data, how do we protect our data and manage legal risks associated with that data. As, you know, Ben was mentioning, those relationships may not carry you very far in the OT, you know, context, because you probably need different relationships with different uh, managers who have responsibility for the the infrastructure itself um, and that can be a real challenge building those relationships can be very hard um, and um, sometimes we've seen clients who start undertake that work and it, they run into internal speed bumps because the feedback that's given to the legal team is you know happy to talk to you about this but just so you know if you touch my systems we're going to have to shut down production and then we won't make any money and therefore you know this will be the end of the company um, which is a pretty tough conversation to be having. I and mean, obviously I'm exaggerating that, but th it's a tough conversation to be having as a lawyer to explain like why you really need to do this and why it's really a priority when the, that sort of connective tissue and relationships are in place. So that's certainly something, I mean, that was frankly the journey that companies went through on the enterprise side, sort of 10, 15 years ago, whatever it would be. Um, but it's a journey I think a lot of com companies are still working on on the OT side, building those relationships from the legal and other teams uh, with responsibility. Thanks. That, so that was a very uh, useful overview of the cybersecurity challenges. So now we're going to talk about some of the, the consequences from potential cyber incidents. Um, and you know, as we were saying, cyber risks can unfortunately turn into cyber incidents. Um, ben and Kai, could you provide an overview of some of the types of consequences that you've seen flow from OT security incidents? Yeah, the, the first and foremost, it's a potential for uh, safety, uh, uh, and and so human life is, is critical in, in all the industries. Uh, uh, certainly, when there's rotating equipment or high pressure environments, uh, there there is a culture of safety. Uh, there there is maybe a lack of understanding that uh, cybersecurity can feed into safety as well. Uh, uh, now, in in the world that we live in, and, and how interconnected uh, and and modern these devices are. Uh, so that's first and foremost, uh, but also uh, destruction of equipment uh, or, or large scale impacts from from a uh, logistics standpoint, which uh, hits the bottom line. Uh, not petty, I love to ten billion dollars in, in damages uh, that that ranges from uh, uh, Merck in, in pharmaceuticals industries to, to shipping and a, and a variety of other uh, uh, manufacturer uh, manufacturers and, and verticals. Uh, and that that was largely caused by uh, the uh, propagation of this malware uh, and, and the lack of strong borders between the, the traditional IT side and the OT side led it to quickly spread into the OT environment where there, there simply weren't any defenses once it got in there. Uh, and that's what caused large scale disruptions. Uh, uh, so it, it's a little bit different uh, on the OT when we start talking about physical and, and business impact and consequences when we're used to talking about uh, a loss of a loss of data, a loss, uh, loss of privacy, it's a much different uh, level of consequence uh, on the on the uh, OT space. Thank you. So taking into consideration that 
these differences, those potential physical consequences that um, Ben just described. A question for Stephen, how have you seen this impact the legal repercussions? Sure. So, um, you know, obviously, if people get hurt, the potential for, you know, ex extensive um, legal liability is, you know, is very real. Um, the scope of legal exposure is very wide. So you can have mass tort actions, you can have litigation with business partners, you know, everything you see in the enterprise context from derivative actions, securities class actions, what have you, regulatory enforcement activities, um, regulatory enforcement that's probably, I think, if if anything, is going to increase um, with the Biden with, with the um, you know the new Biden administration. But I do want to stress that you know obviously you know we can all think of the absolute worst case scenario where something you know physically explodes and really people get hurt. But there are real legal issues and le real legal risk for incidents that stop well short of um, you know those types of outcomes any kind of physical, any sort of physical disruption, disruption in service, anything that a regulator may become aware of, all those types of things that re either re that reveal a weakness in your system that demonstrates a compliance gap or that disrupts the business of a, of a counterparty. There really are very significant legal consequences um, for incidents or even vulnerabilities um, uh, that are sort of mismanaged um, in a way that, uh, you know, just doesn't reflect the company, you know, um, having everything completely in order. So I'd really have said, obviously, the worst case scenario, really catastrophic um, safety and security risks, legal consequences to follow, but it doesn't have to be that serious to have very significant legal risk as well. Thanks, Stephen. And so that to this point of we have this box here, legal risk multipliers. Um, could you share some of the issues that make handling OT? particularly challenging for, for legal counsel? Sure, and this is really, I mean, this is true for almost any legal context that if something bad happens and, you know, litigants or regulators come knocking, it's better to have you have had your house in order than your house not to have been in order. So, you know, re legal mismultipliers really are after an incident, if it turns out that one of the reasons for the incident, or even if they didn't contribute, but, you know, uh, you know coincidental with the incident or the vulnerability management or mismanagement, um, if you don't have your house in order, the risk is going to go up. So maybe that's because people don't know what their roles and responsibilities are. Maybe that's the lack of policies and procedures, lack of internal training and education. You know, maybe there are some very sort of simple security gaps that could have been easily closed. Or maybe there are unfavorable contractual provisions that, um, you know, weren't paid, you know, weren't really paid attention to in the context of the negotiation, but really can come back to haunt the company. So, you know, again, very significant legal risk can be sort of um, realized even without a very significant incident. Um, and there are some ways that it can be it can be much worse if the house sort of hasn't been put in order beforehand. Thanks, Stephen. So that that's a good point to transition on to um, when we're thinking about the challenges and consequences of incidents and then back to the initial background in OT specific cyber threats that we discussed. We decided that for today, we're not going to go into detail of the, the different legal regimes for different sectors or um, specific issues in litigation, um, which we're always happy to talk about at another time if that's of interest. But what we thought we would focus on today is some practical examples of how things can go wrong and ways to mitigate those risks. So in our experience, um, when clients can see what has gone wrong in other circumstances and the lessons learned in different contexts, that can be sometimes the most helpful for your business. So as Stephen mentioned, um, these are uh, scenarios based on real world examples, but we've fictionalized them to preserve client confidences. So for this first scenario, this is one that a lot of companies might face. You're running into a technical challenge when maintenance fails. And I'll, I'll turn to, to Ben and Kai to discuss this first scenario. Yeah, uh, thanks, Veronica. I, I will set the stage and then I'll kick it over to Kai to, to get it into a little bit of more of the details. But the, the challenge uh, uh, when we're dealing with real world is, is it an engineering challenge or is, is it uh, a, like a maintenance issue or, or is it cyber? Uh, several years ago, that, that last piece of war, is it cyber, was never really on the table. Uh, now it's being brought up more and more. Uh, uh, and, and how Dragos approaches that when, when we're walking into a, a uh, oil refinery, uh, uh, we, we're looking at where the crown jewels are. So if we want to have the, the largest disruption of that refinery, 
uh, what's that function uh, that's occurring there, and then dive into that function and understand all the subcomponents that are there and how those subcomponents are attached to each other. That allows us to start chaining together in a tax sequence. So we actually did that for uh, a, a, a client to walk them through what a real world scenario would look like and help them troubleshoot and understand it. Uh, and that's this this gas compressor trip uh, uh, that that we're uh, demonstrating here. Uh, so Kai, if you wouldn't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to you to to I'll go a little bit more in depth in, on uh, what uh, what is typically seen in these sorts of exercises. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, well, it basically an exercise like this is the culmination of the things that we've already talked about in the last twenty minutes or so. You always have to imagine that, of course, in a physical environment, so ICS OT, the things play out in the real world and failures don't happen immediately like we're used to usually in when it's just quote unquote the IT environment where usually an error occurs, I can fix it through reboot or the system is down and I bring up the backup system, but it is although some errors might be complicated, but it is more of an isolated situation. Whereas here, we might be facing an issue that is, as Ben mentioned, completely unrelated at first to something happening on the computer network. And it's not happening as a maximum failure right at the beginning, but it plays up to this combination of, oh my gosh, the system is going down and literally the house is on fire because some equipment heated up and starts burning right away. And we've seen cases like these, and Ben mentioned the Aurora attack. That was an exercise in 2007 that had exactly that as a target in mind. So the issues start already at having a lack of visibility in that industrial environment. And one of the key issues there is not only lack of visibility, but also conceptual understanding that computer systems are not regarded as Windows or Linux or whatever type of computer system in this equipment. They're just part of the equipment, similar to what you would regard in your vehicles. You don't think of the, the navigation and entertainment system in your car as a Windows embedded system or as a car Android system. It is that screen that plays music to me and lets me drive from A to B, right? So it is not viewed in that context that there is actually a general purpose computer in there that might be used for other purposes. But from the other side of the house, IT folks usually do not consider the physical impact. They're used to computers having computer issues that play within the realm of cyberspace, if we want to use that word. But computers malfunctioning, having actual physical impact is just something that is usually not on their radar. So this is where the, the huge issues start when we try to trace the root cause of why a malfunction is happening, lack of understanding on both sides of the aisle, but also huge issues in communications because they don't speak a common language. They don't understand the other issues. Just one example from the automotive industry, SOP as an acronym is not standard operating procedures. No, no, it is start of production. And these issues can multiply pretty easily. So at the end of the day, if you do not train this as a team of teams approach, everyone that has to do with crisis management in your organization, knowing how to play together, how to hand off different tasks, to one another, how to work under an incident command system, this will fail. Um, that is one of the largest challenges that we see. And then the, the technological challenges, having visibility into these highly proprietary and often complicated, and as Ben mentioned, sometimes very old environments that you're not allowed to easily add additional software into. These are the technical quote unquote nuances that are serious, but are kind of the, the afterthought of what I just mentioned. So it starts with communications. It starts with totally different concepts of what the environment is and what it consists of. And that just adds to one another. But ultimately, of course, if you don't know you have it, if you can't see it, you can't defend it. That is just the reality of things.
Very helpful points. Thank you. Um, I'll, we'll jump to the next unless Stephen, you had uh, any legal um, commentary on this one. No, I would just, I mean, the, the points that Kai made from security perspective are quite equally in the legal you know, side. I mean, with respect to preparedness, the ability to, you know, if you're a legal counsel and you don't know, you know, you've got an issue, but you're not entirely sure who to call, you're not entirely sure what language <laughs> the person on the other end of the phone is speaking to you. Um, obviously, if you've gone through exercises and you've got plans and policies that have taken you to that point in advance of the, the real thing, you're going to be in a better position. So, um, you know, just, just to you know, hammer home that point. Yeah, thank you. So the next um, scenario, solar winds, very topical. Um, so since the discovery uh, disclosure in, in December, this has been a prominently in the news. Um, and we've talked up until now until how, I, how IT and OT um, are very different. So that might lead you to think that um, OT is immune from incidents that impact IT, but SolarWinds unfortunately is an example um, that has impacted both. And this was really well explained in a uh, Dragos webinar, which I, I recommend um, as, a, as a good overview of the SolarWinds issue in particular. Um, so Ben, what has been your experience um, of dealing with companies that are facing SolarWinds issues in their OT environment? Yeah, I, I'd say the general theme uh, is largely on even our our, our mature customers. So I, I will be um, very upfront in that some of our most mature customers are in the electric space, which is not a, a surprise with, with regulations in North America that is centered around cybersecurity. Uh, but even they are challenged with uh, understanding the software that they have deployed into into their OT environments uh, and doing analysis to determine if there has been any signs of compromise uh, once they do identify those installations. So really coming back to exactly what Kai said, and you can't defend what you don't know, uh, and you also can't defend it if, if you don't know what it's actually doing. Uh, uh, so th those remain to be uh, key challenges. And, and I'll actually, I'll kick it over to Kai. I, I, so Kai, Kai's been leading the global services, uh, the incident response team on a multitude of these as well. Uh, and so in, any color that you want to add to that, Kai? Thanks, Ben. Yep. Again, basically, this is kind of amplifying what we're currently seeing. Um, the, the themes that we at Dragos, and thanks for mentioning the webinar, but also in our year in review reports, basically over the past two years, we kept mentioning lack of visibility as we just talked about a minute ago and also lack of having gone through the motions of how to, how to deal with these types of incidents leads to these cascading issues that we have and as ben said even even with the with some of our most mature customers and some security teams internal to those environments that are highly sophisticated and very well experienced you're hitting common problems that we keep reiterating. Like again, lack of visibility. They don't have a full understanding of all the software that's deployed. Lack of reach of certain applications. And of course, the, the adversary in the solar winds Orion attack selected software that has a very wide reach in your environment. That was probably one of the reasons why this software was selected. So even if you have good separation in your environment and are dividing the environment between IT and ICS slash OT, and even within those environments, high risk environments versus lower risk environments, if you're just using one monitoring application, one instance of that, you, you might be easily bridging those separations between the environments. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. So when one piece of software gets compromised and that allows a potential adversary to bridge all those separations within the environment. Another issue is just a very benign one, seemingly, but the one we've dealing, we've spent most time on actually is how do you get data for forensic analysis out of these environments? Especially like Ben mentioned in the electric sector where a facility might not be in the middle of a well-developed city, but rather somewhere in the outskirts or out there in the country, how do you get data? We're talking about not huge data sets, but potentially a couple of gigabytes. So something that you could put on a thumb drive easily that we don't care about these days, but how do you transfer that data to your trusted partner? 
Do you actually have data exchange services that are allowed? Can you easily onboard an external partner to these systems? Are they performant enough that you can upload and download a couple of gigabytes without interrupting normal operations? These are the issues we've been facing mostly. And then it's also getting everyone up to speed, having procedures internally in the organization that we know who should be on the calls that we're updating. Everybody knows the language. Is there a standard for how to do the internal reporting? Have you ever worked together with the authorities that you might need to inform? And on and on and on. So again, these, these different minor issues, one one after another, but adding up, even for an experienced team, to a huge problem if you don't do this on a frequent basis, which luckily enough, most teams don't have to do because these things happen in very low frequency, but if they happen, they are quite serious. Thank you, Kai. That was a very useful overview. Um, which touched on a few points that I think overlap with some of the legal issues uh, that Steve and I will touch on later, but Stephen, is there anything you wanted to, to say, you know, thinking of like, our clients also face some solar winds concerns? Yeah, well, we've also worked on these on the IT side, um, and it's really interesting the comparison between IT and OT, I think it really illustrates some of the challenges. And on the IT side, you expect to have visibility, or the most sophisticated companies expect to have visibility to their networks, they expect to be able to remediate issues pretty quickly. Um, you know, this is not always possible on the OT side, and maybe, you know, frequently impossible um, to move at that type of pace. So again, I think it's a really good, this is a really good scenario and that it, it illustrates in that comparison, um, the challenges that, you know, that, that make it difficult to take models that work in the enterprise side and expect to apply them, you know, sort of one-for-one -one on the OT side. And if you're legal counsel, um, you know, it's helpful to have that expectation going in to work on the OT side to know that it's gonna be different and how it's gonna be different. So I think that's, this is a helpful scenario for, for demonstrating that point. Right. Thank you. So now we're turning to um, penetration tests. And as, as outside counsel, we've seen how um, pen tests can be incredibly valuable in multiple sectors for identifying weaknesses that, that could have led to serious incidents. Um, so the, this type of testing can help companies protect themselves. It's, it's increasingly expected by regulators. Um, but at the same time, you know, companies can run into problems depending on the process um, and what you find out during the testing. So for this side, I'll turn again first to Ben. It'd be interesting to hear from your perspective what the Dragos team has seen when performing penetration tests in the OT space. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I have some choice quotes that I can kind of frame uh, some of the the, the findings and in the, in the style and feel uh, to them to, to give them some weight. But the uh, our approach when we're doing a, a penetration test, one, we, we're never really uh, working on a live system. Uh, when, when we're working on, on a industrial process, like certainly we don't want to uh, disrupt uh, production. So often we're working on backup systems, systems that are offline, maintenance mode, or, or just uh, gear that's been provided to us from, from the customer. Uh, but we focus not on how many how many vulnerabilities can we find uh, and be able to, to generate a, a long list of those because Quite frankly, in an industrial environment, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, these systems may have been designed uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, they largely don't have security principles in mind when the software was written, when, when the hardware was uh, produced. Uh, but they, so instead we focus more of a, a consequence driven approach of, uh, again, going back to, if we wanted to have a really large scale impact, what would that look like for this particular gear? And then let's see if we can do it. Uh, so, so the types of reporting that's coming from our our penetration tests uh, and I'll, I'll, some choice quotes that uh, are highly redacted. So, uh, but I, I think meaningful um, is uh, providing a, a pivot path for lateral movement of identified impacts, including caustic overflows at plant, groundwater injection contamination, operational degradation over time through manipulation of uh, telemetry data. Uh, uh, so that that's much different than uh, we gained admin access on your SQL server. <laughs> uh, in, in another example, this was actually a um, a led led to discovery of, of malware, uh, which the the malware was installed uh, on the engineering workstation uh, that was directly connected to the device that was used to uh, quote uh, monitor and control uh, turbines within the power block. 
uh, so these are the sorts of findings that uh, we have uh, uh, within our services umbrella, particularly on, on the penetration tests. I, I don't have more choice quotes, but uh, we, we have come across where we are underscoring the potential for uh, a loss of life or, or large scale, like uh, something affecting an entire fleet of, of equipment. Uh, and so those sorts of findings uh, can can be, of, uh, I, I think, value in, in enumerating, but they also need to uh, have the right visibility within the company as well. So that the, the, the organization understands it rather than one facility. Right. Thanks, Ben. And, and these issues that you've raised tie well to the, my question to Stephen, which is from a legal perspective, what are some of the things you've seen go wrong? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, one, you know, Ben's team or whoever's team, you know, to, to identify these problems so you can fix them. But as a lawyer, if you get that penetration test report and it says things like, you know, water overflow or, you know, things going on in flames, your first reaction is probably going to be yikes um and wishing that it wasn't written down on paper to start with you know i think there's um so from a legal perspective i mean again the most important thing is probably to identify that risk and remediate it from a legal risk perspective the worst case scenario is to have the risk identified and then not be able to not not fix the issue the underlying issue not come up with an appropriate mitigation and then five years later in a regulatory action or litigation up shows this penetration test report that basically says you were aware of the issue that led to, you know, X bad outcome. Um, so from an internal perspective, we find it really important to make sure you're prepared to respond to penetration tests. There is a process in place for focusing where the test is going to be performed, um, processing the the um, the report, um, and then making and implementing appropriate changes to mitigate risk, so that you are both. Um, you know, addressing the security problem, but also in a way that mitigates your legal risk. And generally speaking, we recommend doing this under privilege, particularly if you're not a particularly mature organization, you don't know um, what the, um, you know, the outcome of the test is going to be. You know, we often find it really helpful to have legal counsel involved because legal counsel will have, you know, advice around how to manage the response to the, to the, um, to the test in terms of its, um, you know, any sort of regulatory disclosure or whatever you might be required to do or think about. Um, so yeah, those are some those are some things that can go wrong. Again, definitely, um, you know, we always advise our clients that penetration tests both are typically required by regulation or just a general good risk management practice. Um, but doing them in a smart way um, can allow you to both get the security benefit they provide while avoiding sort of, you know, a unnecessary, um, you know, uh, problem for yourself uh, that could follow from not, not responding effectively when the, the test results come in. Thanks. That's a very helpful overview and ties into our, our last scenario, which is vulnerability disclosures. So vulnerabilities can be identified through the penetration test that we just discussed, but they, they could and, and often do come to a company's attention through an unrelated security researcher or government agency. Um, so Ben, could you share your perspective on some of the challenges OT industry companies face when they receive a vulnerability report? Uh, yeah, so the, the largest, the over, uh, there's so many. Uh, see, the ar largest overwhelming challenge is uh, often they're, they're buying a a component, so, so they're buying a turbine, and that turbine is going to produce energy. Within that turbine, bundled in there is a bunch of components, hardware and software, uh, and th those hardware and software are made up of the other software components themselves. Uh, but that's not visible to the customer. The customer didn't buy all those individual devices; they bought the turbine. So for them, uh, this becomes uh, this almost turns into a a a, a supply chain challenge where they need to identify, uh, enumerate all of those those uh, components and, and understand where the vulnerabilities may be and track them in the future. So, a uh, solar winds is a really good example where solar winds itself was embedded within certain uh, manufacturing uh, uh, verticals uh, and, and often in involved in their maintenance uh, uh, cycle. So the the, the supplier is actually monitoring the equipment on behalf of the customer, and they're using SolarWinds to do that. Uh, that becomes really challenging from, from a facility and, 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 and enterprise perspective to understand if SolarWinds is there, 
when it's it's never been explicitly identified uh, the, the vendor didn't unless the vendor acknowledges that reaches out to the customer you may not have any visibility in order to track that down without a lot of uh, manual identification uh, which touches on third party connections uh, and, and and the challenges uh, uh, from a, a vendor management perspective um, uh, and uh, also uh, the the procurement language that you do have an opportunity uh, when you're you're uh, doing upgrades or bringing new systems online to focus on security language from a procurement perspective that can help get you ahead uh, of a uh, future gear the challenge is the life cycle again is not uh, three to five years as is traditional in, in hardware software in the enterprise it's more of a 15 25 year investment which means the uh, the decisions you make uh, within that procurement have a long lasting effect. Thank you. Very helpful overview. Um, Stephen, is there anything else you want to chime in on this point from the legal perspective? Yeah, just, just really briefly, I mean, we're hitting themes on these all these scenarios. If they're repeating across the scenarios, as you can see, I mean, this is certainly a this is a scenario we've seen many different times where a company's struggling to respond to vulnerability disclosures um, or reports. I think the the takeaway that I'd add really is that the internal policies can be just critical to just add another context to responding effectively. You know, the in prior conversations with Ben and Kai, we talked about you know responding consistently and effectively across facilities and geographies. You know, having a consistent response that you can articulate in a defensible way in litigation is obviously going to be really important. It's going to be very hard to do that if you don't have a a policy that applies across your organization. Thanks, Stephen. And policies are part of what we'll be discussing next. So we thank you again for those really great examples of the challenges that um, you can face in OT. And, but the good news is, and uh, Stephen touched on this briefly, but that there are very practical steps that you can take that significantly mitigate both the legal and the technical risks we've discussed. So we're going to go through those now, but just as a brief overview, we'll discuss understanding your business risk, maintaining appropriate plans and policies, training and practice, prioritizing cybersecurity, and then um, conducting testing and assessments under privilege. So jumping straight into um, understanding risk, that's really a critical, um, critically important in this context. And you can conduct technical assessments and legal assessments to ensure compliance. Those are certainly key steps. And those are really central to understanding your risk in the same way as it would be for enterprise security with some wrinkles. So I'll turn to Ben uh, first, if you could kick us off by telling us a little bit about what's involved in performing a technical assessment to understand the security posture of your OT environment. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it, it does uh, depend on uh, uh, where the customer is on their journey and, and, and how mature they are. Often it starts with, with uh, interview-based discussions, uh, uh, reviewing diagrams and, and, and uh, 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 or the the process flows and, and the subsystems attached there uh, in, in ascertaining just what their architecture looks like uh, and how that matches against uh, various co uh, control frameworks and, and, and our recommendations. Uh, and then it can also uh, journey, uh, move on into physical walkdowns of, e of equipment uh, and, and identifying if What's documented is what is actually in practice. Uh, usually there is a, a, a gap uh, between those two. Uh, be, again, because of the, the facilities are running as lean as they are, uh, they're always in a, a break fix uh, sort of operation. Uh, and so uh, being able to uh, identify uh, if, if this uh, same, uh, the equipment is on the right networks or if they're uh, spanning multiple networks uh, is uh, an easy, a walkthrough where you can validate that with a, a, a eye inspection, uh, and that that is uh, the the typical flow of things. I would say Dragos also offers a lot of value in in connecting the teams together. So so in a lot of ways we do interact with the, uh, or uh, come into a, a company through a, a enterprise uh, 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 sort of stakeholder uh, walking into the facility, and we're. We were bridging the, those communication gaps as far as uh, uh, knowing what is important to the, the facility uh, and those that are running the, the local plant, 
uh, versus uh, the, the enterprise. Uh, sometimes they can be at odds with each other. Uh, and and we we pride ourselves in, in helping to build those relationships uh, after 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 we do leave. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, because those those relationships. I mean, we've also seen how that can be key to having effective cybersecurity. Um, so on that point, Stephen, from from your experience, what have you seen that was successful in terms of the ways that legal and technical teams work together on the types of assessments that Ben has described? Sure. I mean, first you've got to build the relationship then you've got to build some trust into that relationship and then you've got to be able to ask hard questions um you know in that sort of trusting relationship i mean the one of the things i think drago so you've highlighted in various of your reports is that you know a lot of companies think their their systems are totally air gapped and then it turns out that they're not they're not air gapped and there is possible to get um you know to get across those air gaps and, and compromise them and that's the type of thing that's critically important for legal counsel to understand are our systems air gapped are they not air gapped it's a very difficult question to get an answer to without ruffling feathers. So, you know, taking the time to build this relationship, build trust, make it clear that this isn't a gotcha investigation. This is a effort to protect the company as a, you know, as a collaborative effort across groups. I think that's something we've seen has worked, um, been very helpful. And again, doing it under privilege, is, <laughs> you'll see as a theme. Thanks, Stephen. So um, we'll touch on paper compliance policies and plans, which is you know, obviously not enough to ensure security, but having the appropriate plans and policies in place can significantly improve your security posture. And we work with clients where even the process of getting together and preparing new or updated documents has encouraged the relevant teams to work together and that's helped improve security. Um, and obviously uh, written policies can help demonstrate the company's legal compliance. So turn to Kai for this one. Um, in your experience, in the context of OT incident response plans, what, what works and what doesn't? Thanks, Veronica. Yeah, number one is, again, you need to apply a different mindset when it comes to OT incident response. The, the classic cliche example for IT IR would probably be the incident responders come in, shut down all the services that were affected, start doing the forensic analysis, and days later, decide on how to bring those systems back online and have them cleaned up. Imagine an OT environment that these systems are critical to maintaining the function of that environment. So, for example, the, the refinery you see in Ben's background, I can't just go in there and start randomly switching off systems. That would probably reach the, the attacker's intention of blowing up that environment even quicker than what happened before. So maintaining safety and reliability of operations at all times is really crucial if you do incident response. And knowing whom to talk to, and, and like we said a couple of times already, how to speak with people and understanding their requirements, but also some business requirements. If we're talking about environments where just an hour of downtime goes in the thousands or even millions of US dollars, considering when access can be granted to gather important data that you need to investigate is really important. That's number one. The second thing is that in contrast to, again, the IT side of this, working closely together with everybody else within your organization that knows how to deal with crises is really important. That is the legal side, of course, that is PR. But there's also very hands-on crisis management, like everything that has emergency lights on the roofs of their vehicles, like the firefighters, um, emergency responders. Imagine, again, you have a situation in that refinery you see in the background, um, like, like what we saw in 2017 with the incident that Ben mentioned with the crisis malware, where the actual aim was to cause a malfunction in the um, sulfur removal phase of refining crude oil. So sulfurous gases that, that are created there are highly poisonous and explosible. So that is immediately a hazard, not only to the environment, but to everybody working on that plant. But if it is within a neighborhood and I live 10 miles from a refinery, that would be important to me as well as somebody that lives very nearby. So having all these things in mind when you're planning for how to react to an incident and how to interoperate between these different teams. And again, understanding the language, understanding how to 
how to also prioritize activities and knowing ultimately as who's responsible for instant response, when to send in your team, when it's when it's safe to go in there, when it's safe to touch equipment, or you're probably not allowed to, when it when it's safe to take somebody that actually has operational knowledge of the environment to help you with acquiring the data you need to then start the investigation and ultimately help the OT team to go back to a safe state. This is very much different from typical IT side. And to end this, this also means that your incident responders have to have the safety requirements fulfilled to be actually allowed on site. I mean, the, the outlying example is, of course, imagine something happens on a on a oil rig out there on the ocean. Without this helicopter safety license, you're not flying out there um, doing incident response. But even every manufacturing facility usually has some mandatory safety requirements that you have to go through, personal protection equipment, at least an hour of listening or watching a video and listening to a a security a safety lecture, these kinds of things and NERCSIP, these kinds of regulation make it make it even more difficult sometimes. Yeah, and to, to that point, that sort of all these risks that we've discussed show for legal counsel why it's really important when you're working internally to to make sure that you're involved in in the in the policy creation. And we're running a bit short on time, so I'll turn to Stephen um, to add in um, any additional commentary you want to discuss on, on, on this practice point. Yeah, the practice, obviously, you know, tabletops, Ben mentioned the role that Dragos plays in tabletops. You know, we think they're critical, tailoring them, including purpose stakeholders, captures lessons learned. Um, you know, that's part of prioritization as well as demonstrating, um, you know, practicing demonstrates how you prioritize it within um, the organization. If we turn to the next slide, talking about supporting allocation of resources, even during a period of constrained budgets, building those relationships, we probably said that 20 times today, um, and also elevating to senior management and the board is appropriate. So these are sort of other really practical steps um, to take. I also mentioned managing legal privilege. This is something you've probably heard me say 20 times today. Again, not a, obviously a concept you'll be familiar with from lots of different contexts, but one that we think is particularly important in this space. And we did get a question about penetration testing under privilege, you know, we routinely retain security vendors um, to perform penetration tests under privilege. So that's a pretty standard approach. You have to be smart about how you do it. You need to make sure that the SOW is tailored. Ideally, you have the budget come out of the legal function. There are some sort of mechanics that you can work through to mitigate the risk of that legal privilege being waived in the future. Ben and Kai, before we close, do you have any other sort of final thoughts you want to offer? But obviously, from my perspective, thank you for participating. It was really wonderful to have your perspective. I, I know we're short on time. I, I would say we, we focused on a lot of the bad. Uh, the, there is a lot of the good as well. Uh, uh, the, the, the good is that uh, if, if properly instrumented and properly resourced, these environments are very defend, uh, defendable. Uh, uh, and I, I didn't. It's just putting deliberate effort into doing exactly that. Uh, so I, I didn't. Uh, I, I went in on on a positive note uh, as well with, with the investment in in, in focus. Uh, these are very approachable. Uh, there are very approachable solutions to some of these challenges. Yeah, that's a fantastic note to finish on. Certainly from a legal perspective, taking those practical steps uh, are ways to mitigate your legal risk. And um, certainly there are things that can be done that are relatively easy. Uh, up front to get the house in order um, for when the hopefully the, the worst case doesn't happen but in the event you need to defend what you've done um, you can do so uh, more readily so anyway well, thank you everyone for attending we really appreciate your time today and uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you again soon thank you thank you bye everyone